Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General's Hospital. Today's program is part of a dermatology series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Department of Dermatology. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing today's recording, feel free to visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff and the guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical questions or information in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Dr. Yu, would you like to pull up your slides? Great. Yes, thank you so much, Amy. So next, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Jeff Yu. He is the director of the MGH Contact and Occupational Dermatitis Clinic. He is currently on the board of directors for the American Contact Dermatitis Society and is an active member of the Society of Pediatric Dermatology and Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance. His research interests focus on allergic contact dermatitis in children, and he joins us today to give a talk on atopic dermatitis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yu. Great, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about um, atopic dermatitis, which is a very common condition as you guys will see. We're also gonna talk about some of the more, um, more common treatments for atopic dermatitis and some of the less common treatments, perhaps with a little bit of less evidence as well to support it, but we're gonna talk about it just because of a lot of good anecdotal evidence that it does help. So we're gonna talk about the whole gamut of things with atopic dermatitis in the next hour here. Um, as Amy did say, that I am a director of the contact and occupational dermatology here at Massachusetts General Hospital in the Department of Dermatology. Um, and I specialize in both adult as well as pediatric dermatology. So in terms of disclosures, um, I am a consultant for the National Eczema Association. Um, the contents included in this talk are purely for educational purposes and I'm not offering treatment advice. So if you do have atopic dermatitis, or if you're wondering about treatment for atopic dermatitis, please consult a board certified dermatologist for more medical advice. And then none of these photos that I am including in this talk are my own photos or of my patients. They're all coming from various other sources, including textbooks, as well as um, open online resources as well. So kind of the roadmap for today's talk here, we're going to talk a little bit about what's in a name. So what is eczema exactly when someone says you have eczema or I have eczema um, and what, uh, what's in this name and what does it really mean? Um, what is atopic dermatitis? We're going to talk about all of that here. We're going to talk about how to take care of your skin if you are someone who has atopic dermatitis. We're going to talk about the basic tenets of gentle skin care. We're going to talk about various sorts of oils that can be used to help you as well. We're going to talk about topical and systemic treatments, and then we're also going to talk about some complementary and alternative medicine treatments that has been used in atopic dermatitis with good success, except there is just not a lot of published evidence showing that they are, as if, that they are um, highly effective, but that doesn't mean that they are not effective, especially for some of our patients who are suffering with atopic dermatitis. So some of the learning objectives here today is that we're gonna talk about the natural history of atopic dermatitis. How does it start? How does it evolve? What happens when you're a kid and what happens when you're an adult? We're gonna talk about some of the clinical findings of atopic dermatitis. How do we as dermatologists know that's what you have as opposed to some other diseases? We're gonna talk about gentle skincare techniques that you can use for everyday living if you have atopic dermatitis or even if you don't have atopic dermatitis. And then we're gonna see if we can understand how and why we treat atopic dermatitis the way that we do. So what's in a name? Well, you've probably all heard of the term eczema before, but eczema is kind of this large catch-all umbrella term that's relatively nonspecific. It can accompany any one of a various number of, derma, um, of, dermat of dermatologic diseases that I've listed here. It certainly includes things like atopic dermatitis. It includes things like numular dermatitis that people may get in the wintertime, especially when their skin is dry. It can even accompany something called sensitive skin when someone says, oh, my skin has always been sensitive since I was a kid. Perhaps that means you have had a history of eczema 
before. Atopic eczema, winter itch, dermatitis, all these things fall under this large umbrella of eczema. However, today we're going to focus on one particular diagnosis called atopic dermatitis. And in this talk, you may see me use the words eczema and atopic dermatitis interchangeably, but I'm referring specifically to this condition called atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is any chronic or it's a common chronic inflammatory skin disease that can really start at any time. We often think that it's something that children that you start getting as a child, but now that we know more and more that adults are getting atopic dermatitis as well. And I will show you guys a, um, a study that really proves that. Um, oftentimes the rash that you get in atopic dermatitis is an itchy, scaly, and red rash that really can appear anywhere. There are some more common places that I will highlight as well. It tends to be worse in the winter time when we're using dry air, when we're using forced heat, for example. And when people are very stressed, can stress drive certain skin diseases? Absolutely. And atopic dermatitis is certainly not an exception. Oftentimes there's somebody else in the family who has a history of eczema, sensitive skin, or atopic dermatitis as well. Atopic dermatitis is not an infection. So don't think that it's contagious. You can't give it to somebody else. Your child who has atopic dermatitis did not get it from somebody else and cannot give it to anybody else there. It's not often an allergy. And I, and I, and I kind of qualify that with the word usually because there are certainly some cases of atopic dermatitis that can be driven by allergy, but it's certainly allergy is not the cause of atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is not curable yet. However, it's definitely manageable. And atopic dermatitis is not just a skin disease because we know that atopic dermatitis goes so much goes so much further than the skin. People with atopic dermatitis have sleep disturbance, have psychiatric um, involvement as well, including things such as anxiety and depression. And we know that it's more than just a skin disease. A good resource um, for more information about atopic dermatitis is certainly you know your doctor, for example, certainly talk to them. And there are some patient resources available online, including the National Eczema Association as one of the various patient support groups that are available. Atopic dermatitis affects about 10% of the overall population. A larger proportion of children may be affected with atopic dermatitis. These current estimates are about 20 to 25%, but at least one in 10 adults also have atopic dermatitis, but there's probably more because we only recently started to recognize atopic dermatitis as a common skin condition in adults too. It looks a little bit different depending on your age. So if you're someone who's six months old versus six years old versus 60 years old, the presentation of atopic dermatitis is different and therefore it may be confusing to some clinicians out there as well. And the reason why I'm showing this picture of a roller coaster is because patients with atopic dermatitis will often tell you that their course of disease is not a consistent straight line. It's not always good or always bad. It comes and goes like a roller coaster. It has ups and has downs. So known as a chronic relapsing course, it will get better sometimes and then boom, something will set it off and it will get much worse. Oftentimes it's hard to identify that trigger and maybe just exercise and maybe heat and maybe the cold or maybe your midterm exams that's causing you a lot of stress and that will cause your atopic dermatitis to flare. There are many flares for this condition. So we're going to talk about the way that it looks in different populations here. So you can see that at, in a very young child, the different areas of um, involvement, especially involve places like the face as well as the trunk. As you get a little bit older, it starts to move to some of the flexural areas or the areas in the skin where your skin can bend. So for example, the front of the neck, the back of the knees, the, um, the elbow crease areas, those are common places for childhood atopic dermatitis. And then when you become an adult, again, the, the location change, especially we see a lot more hand involvement in adults than we do in children. The natural history or the progression of atopic dermatitis usually starts around three to six months of age. Again, I use the word usually because certainly that is not always the case. About 70 to 80% of all people will develop atopic dermatitis by the age of five. But that also means 20% of the people could develop atopic dermatitis after the age of five, including adulthood. About 10 to 30% of kids who have atopic dermatitis will continue to have it as adults. But you know that also means that about 70% or so of them tend to resolve, but not all the time. The more severe your atopic dermatitis is when you're a child, the more, the more likely you are to have it as an adult. And about 25% of adults who have atopic dermatitis report that it didn't start when they were a kid. They never had it before and they just get it when they are an adult. So there's still a lot about this disease that we don't know, but we do know that it really can show up at any age. Here is a, um, here, here's a great study that was published in 2019 that shows the prevalence or how many patients get 
atopic dermatitis at a certain point. So you can see that in childhood, the prevalence numbers, meaning of all the children, what percentage of children have atopic dermatitis, you can see that it's upwards of 20-ish percents when you're very, very young. Then the prevalence of that starts to decrease over time, meaning as kids get older, some of them grow out of getting atopic dermatitis. And there are fewer and fewer kids that get new onset atopic dermatitis, but that doesn't mean that it still doesn't happen. You can see that by the age of 20 or so, the prevalence is around you know, a little bit lower than 6%, 5%-ish. However, you see this little peak later on in life too, meaning that after the age of 60, there is an increase in the percentage of people who have atopic dermatitis. So again, doesn't matter how old you are, you can still have new onset atopic dermatitis. It just may look a little bit different than what you see in kids. So who gets it? Well, the answer is really everybody. However, there, when people, there is a family history of um, atopic dermatitis or atopic dermatitis related diseases, including things such as asthma or hay fever or allergic rhinitis, there's a higher risk that your children, your sister, your brother, or somebody will have atopic dermatitis. When they looked at twin studies, they see that there's a 75% likelihood that if one twin has it, the second twin will also have atopic dermatitis. And that's certainly higher than, um, than unrelated um, families, for example. Higher income countries tend to have more atopic dermatitis than lower income countries. Urban settings tend to have more atopic dermatitis than rural settings, and certainly colder climates is also more likely to have, or pay, people who live in colder climates are certainly more likely to have atopic dermatitis than people who live in warmer, more humid climates as well. Kids or infants who get atopic dermatitis, certainly the most common age of onset. A lot of parents will say, oh, my child was born with eczema. He's had eczema since the very beginning. And that's a very typical story that I hear in my clinics. Um, this is also the marks the beginning of what we call the atopic march, which is a progression of several diseases that are genetically related to atopic dermatitis. This includes things such as food allergies, asthma, and rhinitis. We know that kids who have eczema or atopic dermatitis are more likely to get these other conditions as they get older as well. This is a photo of the allergic march or the atopic march. You can see that kids often begin with eczema, and as they get a little bit older, they may develop food allergies, and a little older than that, they 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 develop runny nose, rhinitis, things like that, and hay fever. And then as they get a little older, they may develop asthma. These are all genetically related and therefore very common to occur in the same person, especially kids who have more severe atopic dermatitis. So in very young children, you can see here that eczema or atopic dermatitis in infants tends to involve the cheeks, the outside of the um, arms and legs, such as the elbows, as well as the knees. Um, here's a picture of a child who has atopic dermatitis on their face. Here's a picture of a child who has atopic dermatitis on the front of their legs. Um, but as you get a little bit older, this starts to move around a little bit. So childhood atopic dermatitis in kids who are between 2 and 12 years old, the areas of involvement tend to be the skin folds, including the wrist, the neck, the um, the antecubital fossa or the elbow pits, the, the backs of the knees, for example, the ankles, as well as the feet. It tends to be a little bit less red and a little bit less weepy than the um, infant form of eczema. However, they are still very, very, very itchy nonetheless. You can see that as kids get a little bit older, more of the folds area of the skin, right? The ankles, as well as the, um, as well as the elbow folds. These are the common locations, not the same as in infants. And then finally, as you get a little bit older, when you become adults, um, a lot of these patients have eczema that involves their hands. We used to think that it comes from kids who never really outgrew their eczema, but we know that about 25% of adults have new onset eczema. In the most common locations, again, the neck, the hands, and the, the, the flexural folds or the folds of the skin, including the elbow folds, as well as the back of the knees and the ankles. These are the same, um, some of the locations that are similar to, um, to childhood atopic dermatitis. But again, the hands is kind of the characteristic feature in a lot of adults. One of the reasons why we think that way is because adults tend to work a lot more with their hands. So people who are in um, occupations that require a lot more, um, involvement with their hands, such as, you know, medicine or such as nursing, such as housekeeping, such as, um, you know, any sort of wet work engagement, all that can cause a lot of trauma to their hands. So if you're someone who has a history of sensitive skin or eczema, chances are that will cause your hands to flare up quite a bit more. So a lot of times I get this question though, what about food allergies? Could my child be allergic to something he or she is eating that may be causing the atopic dermatitis? 
The answer is usually no. Now, there are certainly a subset of children who do have food allergies that drives part of what you see or their severity and their eczema. But by taking away that food, you are certainly not taking away all of the eczema. You may be preventing a little bit of flare ups. However, again, it is the minority of children who, who, um, who benefit significantly from avoiding foods. Um, patients who have moderate to very severe eczema are much more likely to have food allergies. The estimates is somewhere around 20 to 40 percent. These are the six most common foods that children who have severe eczema may be allergic to, peanuts, eggs, cow's milk, soybeans, seafood, and wheat. Um, however, if there is no evidence of reaction to this when you feed your child one of these foods and the testing is all negative, empiric food avoidance or just getting rid of these foods without any testing or without any evidence, there's really little evidence that shows that actually helps a lot with your eczema and it may be detrimental to your kid's nutrition and their development. So I would advise um, you to talk to your pediatrician or your allergist or your dermatologist about this before doing it. Um, and I have included some references here on the bottom of the slide if um, you are so inclined to look more into it. So when I talk about um, atopic dermatitis, I like to remind people that there are really three pillars to atopic dermatitis. There's something called the immunologic abnormality. So this is the part that your immune system is doing something funny to create atopic dermatitis. There is an epidermal barrier dysfunction or your skin. So there is a natural, there's a genetically inherited defect in your skin barrier that's different than someone else who does not have atopic dermatitis. And then there are certain environmental factors that can certainly take advantage of the immunologic abnormalities in the skin barrier defect that causes the eczema to either get worse or to to really show up. And I want to talk about each of these and how we can prevent that. So kind of focusing on these two pillars here, the skin barrier, as well as the aggravating factors, we have to talk about something called the gentle skin care. So this is what I recommend to all of my patients who have atopic dermatitis and all of my patients who have quote unquote sensitive skin. So the way that we think about this is that um, all patients who have atopic dermatitis essentially have dry skin right? When you have dry skin, your skin barrier is a little bit damaged, similar to this brick wall on the right hand side here. So typically a wall's whole purpose is to keep things in or keep things out. However, when you have a disrupted skin barrier, your wall kind of looks a little bit dilapidated with the bricks kind of falling and then there being a little bit of holes in between them. And the purpose of gentle skin care is to repair that brick wall as well as to create a barrier on the other side of it to kind of reinforce this brick wall. So when can this um, skin barrier be disrupted? It's worse in the winter time because the air is dry. It's worse in elderly because we know that as time goes on, our skin barrier is more more porous and less resilient. We know that with low humidity, such as in New England winters and high force heat, our skin tends to be a little bit worse. And then there are certainly things that we could control, such as harsh soap, detergents, and certain fabrics, such as wool, that can cause further skin barrier disruption um, and, and, and increased symptoms for atopic dermatitis. So the goal of gentle skin care is really to put up another layer and really repair the current um, skin barrier that you do have. So first we're gonna talk about some, um, some different types of soaps. So typically when we think about soaps, we're really thinking about this large group of cleansing products and not everything is by strict definition a soap. So what is a true soap? A true soap is something that's like a fatty acid, plus a strong base. And one example of true soaps, and there are certainly many out there, but one of the original soaps that was made was this brand called Ivory that some people might have heard of before. The pH for this brand is about, or pH for this soap is about nine to 10. So very, very basic for those of us that remember our chemistry, remember pH goes somewhere between um, one and goes all the way up to 14. And the neutral pH is about seven and our skin is kind of around 5.4 to six in terms of the ideal skin pH. So this type of soap or true soap at least has a very, very basic pH that can lead to skin barrier disruption and can often worsen dermatitis. So therefore what I often recommend um, and what my patients are often tell me that work really well for them is something called synthetic detergents. And these are also classified still as soaps and no one's really gonna put this whole synthetic detergent word on the front because people are gonna be very confused by that term, but they still call it cleansers or they call it soaps or something along those lines that gives you the idea that it's something for you to wash your face or your body with. However, the technical term is synthetic detergents and these have a pH somewhere around 5.5 
five to seven. So much more balanced and much more similar to what your natural skin pH is. And it really contains less than 10% of what's called true soap. Now these still clean your body. This still gets rid of grime and dirt and this still prevents um, and still gets rid of bacteria and things like that. However, it's made differently and it's much safer for your skin. So some examples of these, and certainly there are many examples that are available on store shelves, but some of these examples are listed here. And you can see that they call themselves cleansing bar, facial cleanser, um, gentle cleanser, things like that. These are all considered synthetic detergents and none of them are true, true, true soaps, like different examples that we've seen before, but they also tend to have much more balanced pH. And again, there are many examples out there, but these are some of the ones my patient have told me that they have liked. Um, bathing and showering is also important to talk about. There are certainly patients that I meet that shower three, four times a day. Um, the more you shower, the more you are going to dry out your skin. So ideally, I tell people showering less than once a day can can be really helpful in terms of preventing dryness, especially in the winter time. But if you're somebody that is working in an occupation that you're frequently dirty and you need to clean yourself when you get home, or if you are um, playing any kind of sports or intensive exercise and you're covered in sweat, certainly shower. Um, however, know that the more you shower, the more likely you are to dry out your skin. Using really hot water also leads to skin damage and increased water loss from your skin, making your skin even drier and keeping your water to lukewarm or even shorter showers can be very very helpful. However, the most important part to showering is making sure that you are moisturizing afterwards. And this may be a simple concept, but there is really a lot to learn here in terms of moisturizing and how you moisturize. So don't forget, moisturizers are not meant to put water into the skin. It's really impossible to do that. But what the moisturizers do is it really acts like an additional barrier to your skin, which imagine again, like a brick wall, you're putting another barrier on the outside of it. So this will prevent water loss from the skin. There are three different major types of moisturizers that we like to um, that we like to educate patients about. One of them is called lotions, um, and a lot of people refer to all moisturizers as lotions, but these words actually have a very technical meaning. A lot of lotions contain water and alcohol, so don't be surprised that when you put on something like a lotion, it may cause a little bit of stinging or burning if your skin is cut. That's because there is water and alcohol in them. There are creams that are a little bit thicker than lotions, and they're mostly made up of oils and water. And then there are ointments, which are the really the thickest thickest um, moisturizers you can buy, and they contain mostly oil. These words will be labeled on the product that you buy. Most of us don't pay attention to it. However, it's all written there, and I'm going to show you some examples. The big question now is which is better, and no surprise, the thing that is thicker, such as an ointment, tends to be the most moisturizing for most people. So here's an example of a product and on there you can see it says body lotion. So most of us don't really pay attention to those words. What we see is the brands, we see intense healing, we see 72 hours and relief dries tight skin. We don't really pay attention to the word lotion but that lotion word itself tells us a lot about what's in this product. This lotion is mostly water and some alcohol. It may burn when you put it on but it's very thin. So therefore it can come out of a pump pretty easily and that's one of the signs that something is probably a lotion. When you you, um, when you apply it to the skin, it's thin, it's cosmetically pleasing, it doesn't look greasy, so people feel like, you know, it looks great, you can really just go out afterwards. However, it doesn't do a great job moisturizing your skin. The second one here is a different product. And you can see again, the label says moisturizing cream. So you know exactly what um, the composition of this product most likely is going to be. It includes water and it includes oils, but really is minimal on the amount of alcohol. It's definitely thicker than the lotion that you saw there. Oftentimes creams do not come in a pump. They come in a jar that you have to screw open the lid and really put your hand in there because you know it's gonna be a little bit thicker. It's not as moisturizing as the ointment, but it's much nicer than the lotion in terms of its ability to moisturize your skin. It goes on white, it goes on a little bit white, so it might not be aesthetically pleasing for some people, and, but it's not as sticky as an ointment. So finally, we're gonna talk about ointments here. And in my mind, ointments are the best in terms of moisturizing things here. You can see that on the left, it's labeled as a healing ointment. It doesn't say the words lotion. It doesn't say the words cream, it says ointment. So you know that this is most likely going to be the vast majority of this product is oil. It is something greasy, it is something thick, but it's going to do the best job protecting your skin. Biggest downside to ointments, it is sticky, it is greasy, some people don't like it, and that is okay. If you don't like ointments and you feel like you can't keep it on, creams are gonna be your next best bet in terms of making sure that you are doing a good job moisturizing your skin. One of the concerns um, patients often have is I can't put this on at night because I will stain my sheets. 
if you are someone who likes wearing PJs or are able to wear PJs, I often recommend long sleeve shirt, long pants, put this on underneath it, put that on, on top of it. Sure, you will stain your shirt and your pants, but you can also wash that pretty easily. Um, and then that will also really help lock in the moisturizing um, benefits of using an ointment on your skin before you go to bed at night. But everybody has different preferences and that's completely okay. But now that you know, there are essentially three major categories of moisturizers that we should be paying attention to. So I told you about some of the things that I really like to see in moisturizers. What are some of the ingredients that we would like to avoid? So I tend to avoid or I tend to help patients to avoid things that include botanicals. Sure, it sounds great, but don't forget things that are botanical and natural include stuff like poison ivy too. And don't forget that can really set off your skin, but there are certainly very irritating plants and chemicals out there. And just because something is um, agreeable to one person doesn't mean it's agreeable to all. So I try to tell people to avoid botanicals as much as they possibly can. Fragrances, natural or synthetic, really doesn't make a difference. Fragrances are irritating. Fragrances can cause allergies as well. Um, so try to tell people to avoid things that have fragrances. Certainly things that are fragrance free are going to be a bit safer for you. Things that say for babies, this is really an advertising ploy, right? Um, they just so say that so they can charge probably a little bit more, maybe put it in a different aisle, but there's really no evidence and there is no guidelines that say things that are for babies need to be the most hypoallergenic or the safest products out there. These are not, not, these are not good guidelines to follow. And then essential oils. Essential oils, we think about them as, oh, they're natural. They come from plants. They must be so safe for you. But I see so many patients who have allergies to essential oils that are put in diffusers, that are used to make hand soaps, that are put on their body straight because people feel like they have calming properties. They may, however, the, they are also very irritating, especially if you are someone who suffers from atopic dermatitis. Um, here are some other um, products here that you can see, um, you know, here it says baby oil, just because again, because it's for babies doesn't mean that it's absolutely safe for you. Here's a picture of an essential oil, 100% pure essential oil, calming properties. Certainly, yes, but um, this, but lavender, for example, is a very common offending fragrance in people who have allergic contact as well as atopic dermatitis causing worsening flare up of the skin. Calendula is a botanical product that certainly can cause people to flare up as well. Um, and then here you can see milk and honey. Yeah, that sounds fantastic if you eat it. However, if you put it on your skin, sometimes that can certainly cause irritation as well. So again, um, trying to avoid some of these products in my patients who have sensitive skin or atopic dermatitis does work pretty well. Um, I mentioned allergic contact dermatitis here. That's a condition where you may be allergic um, to things that you are putting on your skin. I did do a talk about this um, several years ago that is available online. So if you guys are interested in that, please um, go to the link below and I will talk more about allergic contact dermatitis there. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to go much more into detail here. So Certainly you've heard of oils, um, oils that you can put on the skin. Oils, um, you know, make sense, right? Um, your skin is dry, you need moisturizing, let's put some oils on. However, not all oils are created equal here. And I'm gonna talk about three very common oils that, um, that we talk about and three oils that we do have a lot more evidence on as well. We do know that olive oil, great to eat again, great for your cholesterol, great for your diet. Um, however, it's terrible for your skin. All right, um, it disrupts the skin barrier because of the type of fatty acid that is in olive oil. It actually increases the amount of water lost in your skin and it may promote inflammation as well as the growth of yeast, both of things that we do not want to see when we are somebody who has atopic dermatitis. Sunflower seed oil is probably the best studied of all the oils, and this works really well for people who have atopic dermatitis. Studies have shown that it's both anti-inflammatory it can help repair the skin barrier function. And in one study, when they used it, it actually decreased the amount of topical steroids a patient needed to use to treat their atopic dermatitis. We're gonna talk about topical steroids later, but sunflower seed oil, great oil to use. Coconut oil is also good, but only if you use virgin co coconut oil. That means that the oil was harvested within 24 hours of the coconut being cut down. Um, the longer you wait, the more pro-inflammatory molecules are made in that oil. So the earlier you use that oil or earlier you process that oil, the better. Coconut oil has been shown to be anti-inflammatory. It can lower um, the water loss, and it's also, known, it's also seen to be antibacterial as well. So talking a little bit about treatments here, how do we treat atopic dermatitis? 
And this is kind of a, um, and, and this is a very important part as well, because there are certainly treatments that are, um, that have both risks as well as benefits. I'm going to talk briefly about them. But again, if you have questions about treatment, if you have questions um, about how to manage your disease or a friend's disease or your kids, please talk to a dermatologist um, and they are going to be able to give you much more patient-centered and individualized advice. I'm really talking about the treatment algorithm in a very broad way. So here is a child who has very severe atopic dermatitis, um, as you can see here, red, itchy, extremely bothersome, covers a large part of the body surface here, and your heart just kind of breaks for this little baby here. Um, so what are you going to do about it and how are you going to treat it? So I'm going to talk about first line treatments and I'm going to talk about second line treatments. I'm going to talk about some systemic treatments that are available as well. But the first line treatments that we always talk about in um, dermatology clinic at, that serves really as the cornerstone to all eczema treatment is moisturizing, 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 right? Because moisturizing and gentle skincare that I talked about in the last few slides is really what will prevent you from having atopic dermatitis flares. A lot of the other treatments I talk about really helps treat the atopic dermatitis when you have it, but we really want to try to see if we can prevent these flare-ups, which is so important um, for quality of life um, and things like that. And then we're going to talk about topical steroids and a special type of anti-inflammatory medications called topical calcineurin inhibitors, which are not steroids. So we kind of covered the two of the pillars here with gentle skin care. We talked about how do we protect the skin? We talked about how do we prevent some aggravating factors? The part we didn't talk about, and this is the part that the treatments really try to address, are the immunologic abnormalities that are happening underneath the skin surface that is creating this phenotype or this kind of physical presentation of atopic dermatitis. So the way I tell my patients about topical steroids, and people often get afraid of hearing topical steroids, and I don't blame you, it doesn't sound great. However, topical steroids is kind of like a fire extinguisher. In your eczema, when it's flaring, it's like a fire. So you can really put as much topical emollients, such as moisturizers, and do a, a bunch of gentle skin, skin care and all that as much as you can, but you're really kind of sprinkling water on top of a raging wildfire if you have significant flaring atopic dermatitis. And that's when you really need something that is a little bit more powerful than that. And this is where, we, where topical steroids really come in. It works as a really great fire extinguisher because we wanna really put out this fire and prevent it from continuing to burn. So topical steroids come in seven different classes, class one being the strongest, class seven being the weakest. Don't forget, topical steroids are often also made by a part of your body called the adrenal glands. We all make a certain amount of steroids in our body. However, topical steroids can be used to help decrease inflammation and to help a lot with eczema as well. So class seven is the weakest topical steroid, and that is your over-the-counter hydrocortisone. Um, and you can buy this from you know, your, your local drugstore as any sort of an anti-itch, anti-inflammatory medication, but hydrocortisone 1% is very, very weak. However, it is commonly sold over the counter. Now, other types of topical steroids that we often use will range anywhere from class six, and these are all prescription. Class one to class six topical steroids can be used on various parts of the body for various ages for treatment of top of atopic dermatitis. So if you're a very young child, chances are I'm not giving you a class one or a class two or even a class three topical steroid because it's probably gonna to be too strong for you. I'm much more going to be at the bottom half of this chart. However, if you're an adult who has really bad eczema on an area of your skin that is really, really thick, such as your hands or your feet, I'm much more likely to be on the top part of the chart compared to somewhere else. However, the reason why we have to be careful with using topical steroids is because that there are some side effects. If you are using this topical steroid all over the body from head to toe, you may lead to some systemic absorption. If you absorb a lot of these steroids, there could be some systemic side effects such as overall immunosuppression, weakening of the bones, raising your blood sugar, all those things like that. However, if you use it judiciously and if you use it in only certain areas of the body for a short period of time, this is very unlikely to occur. Skin thinning is another side effect that we often talk about in the setting of, um, over topical, of, of overuse of topical steroids. Your skin will look a little bit more veiny or translucent um, compared to other parts of your body. You may notice stretch marks appear in areas where you are overusing topical steroids as well. Chronic steroid use on the face can certainly lead to acne. And if you use it around the eyes or in the eyes, it can actually increase the risk of glaucoma and cataracts. Again, these are side effects if we are using very strong steroids for a very long period of time on 
on an inappropriate area of skin. Again, talk to your doctor. If you are thinking about treating atopic dermatitis or eczema somewhere, they can certainly guide you in, um, in the right way of using these topical medications. So here are some examples of what steroid atrophy or side effects of overuse of steroids can look like. You can notice some stretch marks in these areas, and you can notice that in this area, the skin has thinned to the point where it kind of looks a little bit translucent, almost very kind of thin cigarette paper-like in a way. So typically, um, if we are recommending different types of, you know, um, moisturizers and treatments for patients, we're gonna recommend something that's really, really thick, um, such as an ointment to use all over the body as a good moisturizer. We're gonna recommend using sort of a mid-strength topical steroid to some of the worst areas of your body in a much weaker, but still safe topical steroid to the worst areas on the face, but making sure you avoid the eyes. You can see that we are very limited in terms of the amount of time we want to make sure that you are using the topical medication to those areas of the body to prevent some of the side effects that I talked about. About. So how do we know how much topical medication to use? We usually tell people that one fingertip unit, or that's how much theory that you would put on for an area of the skin that's about the size of your palm, all right? So again, very limited use of topical medications. We're certainly not applying the entire tube. Um, there are some non-steroidal options that are available out there for people who want to avoid using topical steroids. There are some topical calcineurin inhibitors or anti-inflammatory medications that are not in the same steroid class. However, they're not very strong. So on the left, you can see tacrolimus ointment is available. It's about equivalent to a medium potency topical steroid. And then there's another product called pimecrolimus, and that is equivalent to a low potency steroid. Um, these are the only two non-steroidal um, options that are out there right now for topical use that are in the class of calcineurin inhibitors. There is something called small molecule inhibitors as well. And this is FDA approved for kids over six years old. This is called crisaberol, And this is also equivalent to a low potency steroid. Again, these are not very strong, but certainly good steroid sparing options. Um, if you have someone who was either has some steroid side effects, afraid of steroids, or are using it in very sensitive areas such as the face or in the groin or in the armpit, area that already has very thin skin that may be more susceptible to steroid side effects. So what about some second line treatments? Well, there is a treatment called phototherapy that we do use um, at times for patients who have extensive atopic dermatitis. This is not the same as tanning, and I don't want you to think that is the same as tanning, because when you go to a tanning bed, you are exposing yourself to ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B, and ultraviolet C light. In phototherapy that we use in the dermatology clinic, we limit it to something called narrow band ultraviolet B, which is a very specific wavelength of light. We do know that from decades of study, this has not been reliably shown to increase the risk of skin cancer. However, we do know that going to a tanning bed can definitely increase your risk of skin cancer, such as melanoma. So we do ask people to avoid that at all costs. However, coming into the dermatology clinic for this very specific light treatment does not, has not been shown to increase your risk of skin cancer, and it has been shown to be very effective in the treatment of atopic dermatitis. However, there are some downsides. So here's a picture of what a typical phototherapy booth looks like. You walk inside this booth and you do that for about two to three minutes or two to three times per week for about one to three minutes per treatment. Very, very quick. You are not in there for a very long period of time. However, it doesn't work quickly. It takes about four to six weeks before you kind of reach that dose where it's going to start to be beneficial. And after about 12 weeks of treatment or three months, people saw about a 50% or more improvement in their atopic dermatitis. So again, is it the most amazing treatment out there that's super convenient? Not really. However, it is safe and it is effective if you are able to stick with this rather rigorous regimen of coming in two to three times a week, at least for four to six weeks before you begin to see some sort of benefit. There are some oral medications that are available out there as well. However, these have a little bit more risk um, and you have to weigh the risk benefit profile for each individual patient based on their background and their medical history as well. So methotrexate is, an, um, is a medication that has, it's a very old medication, but it's a medication that's tried and true. Um, it works slowly, but it's something that is safe to use long-term. And in studies, after about 12 weeks of being on this medication, patients saw about 42% improvement. 
Cyclosporin is another medication, um, but it works much quicker than some of the other ones, such as methotrexate. In about six weeks, we saw about a 55% improvement. Azathioprine, at 12 weeks, you saw about 37% improvement. And prednisone, many of us have been on prednisone before for asthma flares, for poison ivy, for various things like that. You almost always see an improvement while you give this for eczema, but you can't do it long-term because there are a lot of side effects, such as immunosuppression, bone thinning, things like that. And when you stop the prednisone, the patients often have a rebound flare. So it's not a great idea for, for treatment of atopic dermatitis. It's okay to use if someone is having a terrible flare and you really need to quiet it down quickly, prednisone may be something good to use for a very short period of time. Ideally, one, two, maybe three weeks, but really you want to keep it as short as possible when they are on the prednisone. None of the oral medications I mentioned though are FDA approved. They're all used what's called off-label, but they're all kind of grandfathered in because they've been used for so long and they're part of so many atopic dermatitis guidelines. People do use them pretty frequently. I'm gonna talk about some of these other treatments though that, um, that may not have as much evidence, but some people feel like they are effective. I'm gonna talk a little bit about vitamin D, probiotics, melatonin, and Manuka honey. So vitamin D, we hear a lot about vitamin D, right? People feel like they're always vitamin D deficient. Sometimes we are because we really don't go outside very much. The sun in New England is also not very strong. Some studies have shown that lower vitamin D levels have been associated with more severe atopic dermatitis. Some people um, feel like by supplementing vitamin D, we're decreasing inflammation and therefore we are preventing water loss from the skin. However, the studies really do not show a consistent benefit in supplementation, meaning that all the studies don't agree. Some studies show that it doesn't help at all. Some studies show that it helps a little bit. Here's a study that I'm basing this on. So therefore take it with a um, you know, grain of salt. If you are vitamin D deficient, supplementing a little bit may be helpful. But again, talk to your doctor about that. Now, the microbiome is something that really has garnered a lot of interest in recent years. What the microbiome is, is that on all of our skin, there lives a number of bacteria and fungus that lives in happy equilibrium, meaning there's a little bit of bacteria, a little bit of fungus, a little bit of viruses, and they all kind of keep each other in check as a normal, normal, healthy skin. However, in people who have atopic dermatitis, we know that there tends to be a proliferation of certain bacteria that tends to drive inflammation, namely one of them called Staph aureus, and you might have heard of this before. So therefore, sometimes people have tried what's called topical probiotics. So you heard about eating probiotics, which kind of helps with the gut flora or the amount of bacteria inside your gut. However, people have tried topical probiotics to kind of recolonize the skin with normal and quote unquote healthy bacterial flora. When they apply probiotics to the skin, they have shown study, or in some studies, they've shown that eczema has improved and the eczema severity did decrease. However, there hasn't been really large studies yet. I've listed some of the strains of bacteria that has been shown to be helpful in some studies. And I've also listed one of the studies that I took it from, published most recently in 2021. So it really just came out and this is really um, novel therapy. And I'm really excited to see what happens in the next several years um, with topical probiotics. Oral probiotics has been studies. They looked at um, preventing eczema in children of parents who have a strong history of atopic dermatitis. So they give pregnant mothers or infants oral probiotics to see what happens. Um, however, there is a possible role in prevention. However, it's really hard to say if those kids are ever gonna get eczema in the first place. However, if they have eczema already, meaning that if your child or you already have eczema, you can take the oral probiotics. Studies really don't show that it makes that big of a difference for your overall disease. Melatonin is a chemical that helps you sleep, that helps us sleep. It's made naturally in the body, but you can certainly supplement it. They have shown that by taking three milligrams of melatonin for about four weeks or so, it made you fall asleep faster and improved your overall eczema severity. That was shown in a study done in 2016. And then Manuka honey is a, um, is a honey that is derived from a certain type of tree, um, especially found in New Zealand. It has been found to decrease staph bacteria or that bad bacteria that we often see on the skin of people who have atopic dermatitis and it can decrease inflammation. They've only done really small studies on this and they're open label, meaning the participants knew they were getting this medication. So there could be some placebo effect in there as well. They haven't done larger studies and they haven't done blindness studies yet. So again, take this with a grain of salt. So to, to, to finish up here, I want to talk about the um, probably, the, well, so far the most 
impactful medication that patients with eczema have been able to get for about the last four to five years. And it's a medication called dupilumab. This is FDA approved and recently has been FDA approved down to kids six years and older. And they are doing studies on even younger children now. It blocks a key pathway that causes atopic dermatitis to occur. It blocks two um, specific um, cytokines called interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, and it blocks those to prevent the eczema from showing up. It is an injection that you give yourself every two to four weeks. The good news with it, it doesn't suppress the immune system. We don't really tend to lab uh, monitor labs at all. And besides a few side effects, such as an itchy eye, um, perhaps an increased risk of cold sores coming back, overall pretty well tolerated in terms of a systemic medication. And it works really well. The data really shows that in kids 6 to 11 years old, 70% of kids has 75% of greater improvement. In kids 12 to 18, 75% achieve 75% of greater improvement. And then in adults, almost 70% achieve 75% of greater improvement. So very, very effective if used and if taken. Now, some of the side effects, the itchy eye that I talked about, injection site reaction, cold sore recurrence, things like that, but overall minor compared to some of those or other oral medications that I talked about that had less efficacy than this. Now, looking into the horizon, there are a lot more systemic medications um, coming up for um, atopic dermatitis. Now, all of these will remain to be seen how effective they are and compared to some of the study, um, current treatments that we have available. I think that's really important to do to see how effective they are compared to our current paradigm. They may be more effective, they may be less effective. And of course, what is the side effect profile as well? But there are a lot of new medications coming down the pipeline as well. So to kind of finish up here, atopic dermatitis is common in both adults as well as children. By, um, by aggressive moisturizing and gentle skincare, this is really the cornerstone to all the treatment regimen because what we want to do is we want to prevent atopic dermatitis from occurring. There are a lot of choices when it comes to the treatment for atopic dermatitis, as I had mentioned, and there are many more choices that are coming down the pipeline, but it really remains to be seen how effective they are. So um, I welcome any questions and I want to thank everybody for your attention. Um, and again, um, please let me know if you guys have questions and I really look forward to, um, to, to any comments or suggestions that you guys have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu, for your presentation. It was very helpful. So now we are at the end of the session. If you have any questions for Dr. Yu, feel free to enter them in the chat box. So Dr. Yu, we have some questions for you. First being, what treatment would you use on an infant that has more than 50% of the body affected? Sure. So I think for infants, we have to be especially careful. Um, their skin is extra thin. Um, they are much more susceptible to potential side effects from overuse of both topical as well as systemic medications. So therefore, if I were to see an infant who has greater than 50% of the body affected, first off, I would try to figure out what the patient is using, because certainly there are things that parents could use on young children that may be causing their eczema to get worse. So by avoiding certain harsh chemicals, by promoting gentle skincare and moisturizing, if they're not already, that can often help a little bit. But again, when you have flaring atopic dermatitis, think about it as a fire and you really have to put it out. I would most likely start a course of gentle topical steroids for at least one or two weeks and see how they do and have very close follow-up with them just to make sure that they are getting better. Thank you. How common are genital areas, areas involved in infants? So that's a great question. So genital areas is one of those locations that we do not expect to see that are involved in atopic dermatitis. The reason for that is because atopic dermatitis tends to affect areas of the skin that are very dry. The groin area, especially in infants who are most likely diapered, does not fit that category at all. They tend to be warmer. They tend to be a little bit more um, wet, especially from, you know, from urine and things like that as well. So genital areas are, tend to be spared in the setting of atopic dermatitis. If your baby has a genital rash, there are various other causes, including things like irritation from, um, from, from bodily fluids and things like that. And I would check with your pediatrician about that. Thank you. Is there any way to predict which infants will grow to have persistent atopic dermatitis? So the more severe the atopic dermatitis they have as kids, the more likely they are to have it as adults. And certainly if there's a very strong family history of adult atopic dermatitis and mom, dad, grandparents, that probably also um, points to the fact that the kid may have atopic dermatitis when they're adults. 
based on the prevalence chart that you showed earlier, does childhood eczema resolve in adulthood? So most cases of childhood eczema may resolve in adulthood. However, about 10 to 30% of kids who have eczema go on to have continued eczema in adulthood and adults can certainly develop eczema as adults that completely, um, completely new. Mm -hmm. And how likely are infants with mild atopic dermatitis, sorry, atopic dermatitis likely to develop other atopic conditions later in life, such as allergic rhinitis, asthma, hay fever? Fairly likely. Um, we do know that the more severe the atopic dermatitis, the more likely they are. However, even kids with mild atopic dermatitis could have, you know, re just, just seasonal allergies to things like pollen that a lot of us do um, that could have some exercise induced asthma. Um, it's hard to put a number on it, but we do know that kids who have atopic dermatitis certainly have the genetic predisposition to getting those diseases. And I believe you covered this earlier, but the question is, is there a genetic predis sorry, <laughs> is there a genetic predisposition to atopic dermatitis? Absolutely, because we see this running in families, we see this in twin studies and things like that. And would you say eczema can be brought on by factors such as stress? Yeah, so stress can certainly lead to a lot of, um, um, can lead to the worsening of a lot of skin diseases. Eczema is not going to be caused by stress alone, but flares of your eczema or flares of your atopic dermatitis can certainly be brought on by stress. Okay. And do you have any advice for the hypopigmentation seen after resolution of the eczema? Yeah, so, so post-inflammatory hypo or hyperpigmentation, meaning lighter or darker skin, is not uncommon to see after eczema has resolved. Um, we off, I often tell people this is kind of like a little footprint that it leaves behind when it goes away. However, it takes time. So the best thing you can do is make sure that you are still moisturizing your skin, make sure you're preventing the next flare of eczema, and every time you go outside, use sunscreen because skin that is not affected by eczema is going to tan a lot faster than skin that is affected by eczema. So in the summertime, people often come in for skin discoloration due to eczema because they see that, you know, their tan skin looks very different from the skin that wasn't tan. So sunscreen and moisturizing are the two best things that you can do. And how long does it take for it to resolve usually? It can probably take up to a year, but, I, but, but, but in reality, several months at least. Okay. And moving on to the next topic, is wet to dry dressing still used to treat eczema? We don't use wet to dry dressing to treat eczema. However, we do something called wet wraps and this may be what you're alluding to. Um, wet wraps is where that we will put a moisturizer on or a topical steroid and cover the child or the adult with wet pajamas. We know that by doing that, it actually leads to greater penetration of the topical steroid and it kind of increases the strength of it and makes it work better. So wet wraps, we usually keep people in it for, you know, not until it gets dry because that will really take a very long period of time. However, we put, it, we put them in it um, and then we get them out of it after about 30 minutes or so. So we don't do the traditional wet to dry dressing that some people may think about. However, we certainly do wet wraps. And is our wet wraps done in the clinic at the hospital, doctor's office or at home? Yep. So wet wraps can certainly be done at home. Um, there are kind of wet wraps kits that you can buy online to help you with wet wraps. Oftentimes we will do it in the hospital as well, especially if a child is admitted or an adult is admitted for significant eczema. The nurses can certainly help with that as well because it can be pretty intensive and pretty messy to do it. But we don't do it in the clinic because there, um, there isn't really the space to do it. However, hospital or home are the two places where we tend to do wet wraps. And should one consult with the doctor before trying a wet wrap? method at home? I absolutely would because um, you can certainly have more steroid side effects if you are doing wet wraps too often or, um, or for too long or with too strong of a steroid. So I certainly would talk to a dermatologist before that. Is there a difference in efficacy between various oils such as coconut oil, sunflower oil? I think that's a great question. We don't know the answer to that yet, just because um, coconut oil, sunflower oil, they're not very well studied. And certainly there are no head to head studies that really have shown that there's a significant difference in efficacy. What we do know is that some oils benefit people with atopic dermatitis and some oils like olive oil really doesn't. But that would be really interesting to see if there's a significant difference. However, what you're really looking for is does it moisturize, yes or no? And coconut oil and sunflower oil certainly do moisturize. How about tea tree oil? Are they considered an essential oil? Is it recommended for eczema? 
Yeah, so tea tree oil is certainly not recommended for eczema because there is a proportion of people who are allergic to tea tree oils. Even though some people feel like it has antibacterial and calming properties, tea tree oil has been seen as an allergen in a subset of my patients. I would say best thing to do is to avoid it. So I think that's all the questions that we have today. We'll give it another second. And while we wait for that, Dr. Yu, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Um, so atopic dermatitis is much more common than we really think. Um, and I would say if you're concerned that you have eczema, there are certainly treatments um, out there. You don't have to suffer with itchy skin you know, every single winter. Certainly consult your primary care doctor, talk to your um, local dermatologist. They certainly have good advice. And it's a very common thing that we see in clinics. So there's certainly help is available. Thank you. All right. So I think that's all the questions that we have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu, for joining us today. Thank you everyone for joining our presentation. We hope you found it helpful. As mentioned, if you'd like to view the recording of today's session, feel free to visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.